All right, joining us now with more on the market impact of that earthquake in Chile is Ed Mir, senior commodity analyst at MF Global. Ed, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, no. Let's ask first about the, the the production problems that this poses. I mean, what are you hearing about the extent of the damage in mines there, uh, if and when they'll be able to get back to work? Well, uh, uh, as you pointed out earlier, um, most of the Chilean mines are located north of the country, at least the major ones. So they've, they've escaped pretty much unscathed. Um, all weekend, we, we were uh, hearing reports that, uh, you know, uh, out of the 5 million tons that Chile produces, 1 million tons was temporarily uh, sidelined. Of that 1 million, most of it, uh, I would say maybe 80 to 90 percent, has come back on stream. So uh, uh, there, haven't, there hasn't been any structural damage to any of these facilities. What's going on instead are the sort of the logistical problems we're having, like getting power connected to the mines, getting diesel fuel to run the generators, getting the roads cleared, things like that. So I don't think it's that serious. You know, Ed, we were just talking with our, our reporter, Zara Burton, about, you know, whether or not this is just a short-term play here, a short-term move, or long-term. You think it's just temporary? Yeah. Uh, well, it, it could have some staying power. After all, you know, it's a big uh, bite of the apple to, to sort of have Chile mm -hmm. under the gun like this. So, uh, you know, it, it, could, uh, um, it, it could kind of elevate the trading range a little bit. But I, I don't think it's going to start any sort of a upwards stampede to like 8,000 or anything like that anytime soon. Keep in mind, we have a lot of inventory both on the LME, on the exchange, as well as uh, with producers. And, and demand is relatively sluggish uh, outside of China, so that, that's helping. I wonder, you know, a couple of weeks ago, last week, we would have been talking about the dangers of the price falling out of the bottom of cop the copper market because there are so many speculators in China holding, co holding copper. Is that still a concern for you? Is it heightened here? Uh, the volatility has been incredible, as you pointed out. I think we had a, a $1,000 move down, uh, which is about 50 cents a, a pound, uh, a, a month ago. And then we had an equally, uh, an equally big move on the upside, also about $1,000, just, just two weeks later. So I think that's kind of par for the course right now. You're going to see these big swings. And let me ask you, if I can, since we've got you, and I hate to switch gears, but i got to ask you also about gold, because we have a story on the system about George Soros, how he's singling um, out the gold bubble, and he's, you know, been putting, apparently, uh, more money into gold, uh, um, gold trust, the Spider Gold Trust. I mean, where are you in terms of gold right now? I think gold, I mean, if you look at uh, the gold price, it's pretty cheap. Inflation adjusted, it should be around to uh, $2,200 or $2,300. That, that is if you take it back to 1980 levels. So sort of on a theoretical modeling basis, it's cheap. The thing is, this year, I don't think we'll see much action in gold because I think the dollar is going to surprise to the upside uh, most, more dramatically than it will on the downside. So I think that's going to generate a bit of a headwind for gold prices into uh, 010. Maybe 011 will be a better year. All the smart money's in there. I mean, Carol mentioned the Bloomberg story, uh, George Soros doubling his gold ass, uh, holdings, I should say, in uh, in the end of last quarter. You have, obviously, John Paulson piling into gold, sure. John uh, Tudor jo Jones. Sure, and they're, they're all down so far this year. So it uh, doesn't mean anything. When do we see $2,000? I mean, you, you point out that inflation-adjusted 1980s levels would be about there. You know, this is sort of an... Uh, it's an out year play. You know, you're talking about huge deficits going forward. You know, you could have little, little cycles within a big cycle. So I think this is a bit of a down cycle in what could be a, an out cycle in 2011 or 2012. I mean, Ed, in terms of what we're seeing in ter uh, regarding the metals trade, I mean, is it all just a play here on the dollar right now? Pretty much. I think if you sort of chart these uh, commodity prices, they're, they're really tracking the euro, very, um, mainly euro-dollar, I should say. Um, and, you know, the correlation has been very, very close. Uh, the problem is, outside of the dollar, you know, y you don't really have a compelling case for any of the other currencies. Europe has its problems. England is struggling. Sterling has just crumbled today. You can't buy the Chinese currency easily. Uh, so, you know, where are you going to go uh, with a currency play? You're probably better off staying with the dollar than sort of uh, play, playing the others right now. Bottom line, you disagree with George Soros that gold is the biggest mm -hmm. asset bubble out there. 
Do I disagree with him that it's the biggest asset bubble out there? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Well, it depends when in the cycle you're talking about. I also read that he, he likes to bet on bubbles because that's where you could make a lot of money. So uh, you can have a, you can read it both ways. All right. Hey, Ed, thanks so much for joining us. Ed Meir there, senior commodity analyst at MF Global.